Welcome today to the Learn With Lowell podcast. I'm your host, Lowell. Today we are joined with Kristen Glorioso, MD and PhD neuroscientist, founder of NeuroAge and Longevity Global. Today we are digging into the drama of supplements and specifically metformin and near Brazili, research into Alzheimer's, Aubrey de Grey canceling, Brian Johnson's 2 million a year longevity thing, and brain age. We get into a lot in this episode and Kristen has done something new and novel for the show. She has opened up an actual trial upon release of this episode so that people can join and be a part of research and be on the cutting edge. She only needs 50 people for her beta trial. People always ask, how can they help? Well, check out neuroagetx.com, link in the description, and participate. She only needs 50 people. This is really cool. First time someone's ever done something like this, so let's, let's uh, send some love her way. If you like this type of unedited, long-form content, please like and subscribe. Every bit helps. We're working to put out two to three new episodes every week at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time on Tuesdays and Thursdays and have cool things planned for when we reach 10,000 new subscribers. Let's stay curious to learn about Kristen, longevity, brain age, and more on this episode of the Learn With Lowell Show. The the guy that you were responding to is near Bar- Brazili, which is a, a longevity guy, I believe. And he was talking about how he's taking metformin as a supplement, which everyone's always talking about how great metformin is. Like, I just, I hear nothing but great things about metformin. And you <coughs> raised this really interesting take that there's some research su- uh, suggesting that uh, it may increase Parkinson's disease in, um, uh, in non-diabetics who take it as a supplement. So I, I love to you know start there, unpack that, and have like a better understanding. Because I only ever hear people saying, you know, positive things, which is okay to like say negative things, because like then we have a bigger discussion about it. Yeah. So so, near bars lie uh, is a proponent of metformin use um, for aging specifically. He's ha- he's a professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, He's also uh, been trying to get the TAME trial off the ground. So the TAME clinical trial is um, a a trial specifically for aging. So uh, it's unusual in that way. So instead of going after a disease indication, it's going after multiple phenotypes that uh, are age related. So I think that part is great. Uh, I think we need a way to measure aging in clinical trials. Um, metformin itself is approved for diabetics, um, for reducing diabetes. And in, in that sense, because it is helpful for diabetes, it's very good for lifespan in people that have diabetes. Um, however, if you look at clinical trial data, uh, there's evidence to suggest that it, it increases risk of Parkinson's disease. And the way that metformin works is it uh, it has multiple mechanisms of action, but one of them is that it uh, inhibits a part of your mitochondria in the electron transport chain called complex one. Mm. Um, and there are a couple of other drugs that do the same thing that we know cause Parkinson's. So it does a similar thing to other drugs that we know cause Parkinson's. So rotenone and MPTP. So rotenone is a, uh, a pesticide and we know that workers that were exposed to it, uh, that uh, were doing uh, farm work, ended up getting Parkinson's. So that's how we found out about rotenone to begin with. And it's also complex one inhibitor. So there's mm-hmm. reason to believe that metformin could be a bad actor for the brain. And you know these long-term studies haven't been done with it in non-diabetics before. So I think, and there's a, you know, the biohacking community is really looking for anti-aging drugs in the form of supplements or especially approved drugs because people think they're safe because they've been through clinical trials, but they've been through clinical trials for something else and in a different population of people. So for me, I would not take metformin <laughs> if I would, you know, I- unless I had diabetes and was prescribed it. Does it not... Why wouldn't it happen in um, people with diabetes populations? Is it just like the, like it's just not uh, noticed or why only for non-diabetics? Yeah. So we've looked at, so I think it's probably also a risk for diabetics to be honest, Mm. but I think the risks outweigh the benefits or the benefits outweigh the risks in that it's so bad to have diabetes that that's, yeah, more of a problem for your lifespan than Parkinson's, the potential risk of Parkinson's. But it, that remains to be 
to be shown because when they do those clinical trials, they're looking at short-term outcomes, right? They're generally not following people for 10, 20 years to look to see if they get Parkinson's disease. So we're just starting to accumulate that evidence. Mm. Is it possible to offset that issue in developing Parkinson's, like the, the breakdown of the mitochondria? Or is that like a tentpole feature of, of metformin? We don't have anything that can prevent that. Okay. Um, so uh, if we did, we would probably use it to treat Parkinson's in general, and that would be great. But we don't have those capabilities right now to, to protect from uh, damage to mitochondria. Um, the other thing is, is that there's not a lot of good evidence for metformin extending lifespan in animals. Mm. So even that, so if people want to take it because they think it's going to extend lifespan because there's animal data, most of this mouse data that's come out of um, ITP, which is an um, interventional testing program, which is this really well done, large multi-center mouse studies, um, has shown that metformin isn't extending lifespan in mice so so the the benefit isn't even really there hmm. so uh, so to risk potentially getting parkinson's for something that doesn't really have evidence for extending lifespan doesn't make sense to me that's why i think it's it's a dangerous narrative to be pushing this um and it's one of it's you know you look at all the popular publications and metformin 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 we should all be taking metformin um I think it would be great to have something that people take, but metformin isn't it. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it sounds dangerous. I mean, would you want to live longer if you had Parkinson's? Well, I mean, like, would, would you want to get like kept extra years, but then increase your likelihood of Parkinson's? Like, if, is the cure worse than the than the than the poison? And at the same time, it doesn't potentially cure anything at all. Yeah, you see all the headlines. You see the papers talking about it. And so you're saying that there's not that much. I haven't read the publications. I haven't read the data guide just because I don't take up, you know, those type of supplements. So it's been like on my shelf to like ask people about and learn more about it. But uh, so there's not that much data supporting that it does anything. Like there's not been like exhaustive like mice studies or anything like that to see if that does anything. Well, there have been exhaustive mice studies, mm. but they've come back uh, without. Okay. It. So I don't, I don't really understand why this narrative has been pushed like this. It, maybe it's because it's one of the only drugs that has, you know, historically people have thought have had potential. Also, a lot of the papers that have come out with this uh, risk of Parkinson's have been in the last three years. Hmm. So maybe it's just an older narrative that people haven't caught, caught up to yet that there's these risks. It's like 2019, 2020, 2021 papers. But I think it's historic, you know, people have been looking at metformin in lower organisms for a really long time and had a lot of hope for it uh, being anti-aging. I just think that hasn't worn out with yeah. uh, mouse and human data. Is there a study looking to go into this more or is it like kind of conclusive at this point? Like there's no like steel man argument that could be made, like hit the data could be there's sometimes in stats you can kind of like move the numbers around a little bit, but you sound very confident in this. So I, I assume that like either would you recommend more research to be done? And if, if so, what, or is there um, any possibility that like the, the studies are wrong? You know, like I'm just trying to think like, every, it's kind of like if everyone's like jumping off a cliff, I'm kind of curious, like, why are they doing this? Like if what benefit are they doing it? But if, if there's evidence suggesting the alternative, I'm kind of curious, like why they keep doing it. But I think it sounds like you're, you're, you're uh, wondering the same thing. Well, I think it's, you know, I think it, I think people are doing it because key opinion leaders are saying to do it and yeah. popularizing it. Um, why are they doing that? That, that I'm not sure of. Yeah. So, um, uh, Brad, Brad Stanfield, who's like, a, he, he asked me to be on a podcast. He recently changed his mind and you know, used to be a big proponent of metformin. Now he's telling people not to take it. And so he asked Nier to be on his show with him. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen, but maybe we would get some answers then, you know, what the debate is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Nier, 
pointed to a review paper that he wrote, but it's a little bit older of a review. It doesn't include these recent studies. And I think, um, I don't remember, but he may have, I, I don't remember if he re responded back to your tweet in the sense of like, is he aware of the research? Like, is he so busy that it just it hasn't come up? That's one of the big things. Like, uh, people assume that scientists, uh, innovators are always getting, like, they're able to keep abreast of everything, but just, there's just so much coming all the time. So I just, even if it's been like three years, I wonder if like, I'm just trying to think if he responded to it, because if he was even aware of the research, you know, because the, the, the proof is in the pudding in that case. I don't know if he was even aware of it. Um, cause I don't think, I don't think, uh, now I'm thinking about it. I don't think he responded back to your point. So I, there, there's like a, there's a hypothetical situation where he's not even aware of the research, which would be very unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, you'd basically just, ha I mean, I think it's, since it's something that he thinks about so much and talks about so much. I would guess that he's aware, but maybe not. I mean, you'd have to go onto PubMed and it basically you have to Google it every so often, right? <laughs> and if you're not if you're not doing that, then maybe you're not aware. Um, and the other thing is, is there there are conflicting papers, you know, for various things. I mean, in this case, I, I read the human studies. I don't think they're conflicting. They're all kind of negative or neutral on metformin and and neurodegenerative disorders, but. In some cases, you get one small study that says one thing and then another study that says another thing. And then, you know, trying to figure out what's what, it's, it's hard. So I, I hope he responds. I hope we get an answer from him on this. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm reaching out to him or someone's reaching out to him on my behalf. So if he comes to my podcast, I, I will make sure he answers this. And I'll also clip the section and tag him. So that we'll Great. increase the likelihood that he gets to see this. Um, you know, is there anything in this space so metformin in the do not do is there anything that has research that has you encouraged for it either that you're working on with your companies or just in the space in general yeah so we're working on new drugs and so are several other uh longevity companies so i think there's going to be um really good drugs that are approved that have all the research behind them that are safe that are effective in the next 10 years so my company, NeuroH Therapeutics, is working on drugs for the brain specifically. Um, there's some other companies that are working on drugs in other parts of longevity. So BioAge Labs just had a really big um, trial for muscle aging, which was successful. So they're um, going to go on to further clinical trials after this. Um, but that's very encouraging. So I think there's going to be better things than metformin soon that aren't aren't going to have these problems when um people i i like posted everywhere i think you responded to some of them and the people were dming me they were like oh here's some questions to ask and so one of them uh and i don't remember the person's name and i didn't write it down so i apologize you know uh comment if it's you i apologize uh they were asking um like people always talk in the next like 10 20 years um uh, but they were generally wondering just like what's the uh, what's the like end of 20, 2100, like what would be the state of human health span and longevity in your, in your opinion, as someone who's like on the forefront? Yeah. Okay. So about 80 years from now. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm well, I'm going to be alive probably <laughs> barely. <laughs> Um, I think people will be, you know, you can expect, so right now the oldest li living person um, died at 121 or 125, something like that. I think we can expect that mo like many, many more people are going to live to that long and they're going to live that long healthy. So we're going to figure out drugs that can not only cure most diseases, but also increase health span. Um, and I think everybody's afraid of being of of their like sickest oldest relative whatever they envision that person to be to like just being that way longer but that's yeah. not actually what's going to happen and I'm quite sure of that because of what we've seen from the animal studies so anytime you make a mouse live longer either by genetics or by drugs or by calorie restriction or whatever exercise you also um, extend out 
the age of onset in which they get diseases. So they get heart disease later, they get cancer later, they get, you know, muscle wasting later. So it's actually really hard to create a drug or an intervention that's going to make you just sick for a long period of time until you die. So like that Mm -hmm. fear that everyone has, like the the good news is, is like that's almost certainly not going to happen. Um, so I think we're going to, but I think there is a limit in our current state uh, for how long our organs are going to be healthy for, right? So I, I think 120, 125 is probably that limit at this point. Um, but people are working on replacement parts, though, so for most things. Part of why I study the brain is I think the brain is going to be the hardest to replace. Because yeah, we don't even really understand how it works, right, at this point, uh, let alone being able to replace it. The heart is a series of pumps, right? So, you know, mm-hmm. having a replacement heart is pretty straightforward. Um, transplant, grow a new one, create a mechanical one. We're kind of already there. Um, and we'll be there with most other body parts. Um, but the brain is going to be kind of the last frontier. But... You know, it's possible in 80 years that we've figured that out. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for Neuralink, Paradromics, and these other companies who are going to, we're going to have data just like every day, really deep stuff going on. And uh, I'm hopeful that it'll be like, you know, a, the positive version of Christopher Columbus crossing the, <laughs> the ocean blue, you know, nothing bad happening to anyone. Uh, like, uh, a lot of research coming from that actually uh, touching on uh, Alzheimer's something happened like six months ago and I, don't know, I was like wait it was way more than six months ago if it's more than six months ago time just mean nothing, nothing to me anymore every day feels like a lifetime but uh, they were saying there was like some like stump something that happened where like there was some fundamental research into what causes Alzheimer's I think it was like the beta element pro- proteins or maybe the plaques and there were like some some researcher like fubbed the numbers or something and then like a lot of stuff was built off of it so I don't I wasn't able to get into this and so uh, and I'm sure other people who are not in the know or like probably heard about it as well, but they don't understand it. And it, based on your head nod, you remember this. So okay. what happened and do, does it invalidate a whole line of thinking? Like what, what, what's the significance of this? Yeah. So what happened is, and this happens a lot, unfortunately, in scientific papers, you see that people made up data. So somebody was looking at the images in a bunch of the really important papers, six or seven of them, and showed that there were faked Western blot lanes. So like pictures of gels, which are like scientific proof of things happening, were faked. And to the extent that they had even made up a whole protein class that doesn't actually exist. And then people went to replicate those results and to publish more papers and couldn't do it. And then they thought they were just doing something wrong. And then it didn't, that didn't get reported. And finally it came out that there are a bunch of faked publications. So how much does it change things? Well, I'm going to say that this is not something that's clear cut. 50% of people would agree with what I'm saying. 50% of people would disagree. There's some people in the middle. (laughs) So I'm going to give that caveat. Um, But I am in the camp of the amyloid hypothesis is wrong, just totally Mm. wrong. And that we've created all these drugs to get rid of. So basically the amyloid hypothesis says that you have this protein called amyloid beta. It builds up junk, like junk in your cells and kills cells. And that's the reason people get Alzheimer's. So, and so then all of these pharmaceutical companies for decades now have created drugs to get rid of those amyloid proteins, thinking it's gonna cure Alzheimer's. They've all failed pretty much, those drugs. And so um, there's, so the reason that, so this is historical, it dates back to when Alzheimer's was first described, right, in the early 1900s. Um, They saw all these plaques in the brain, this buildup of proteins and they thought this must be it. And so they defined the whole disease around it, uh, the neurologist that discovered this. And so then that led people on this, on this track. 
And then it was combined with, in the 90s, making mouse models to try to prove that um, amyloid was the reason that people get Alzheimer's. Mice don't normally get Alzheimer's disease. They don't get dementia the way people do, and they don't get these plaques building up. So to have a causal way of showing it, they had to create a mouse that has these plaques. So what they did is they took the human amyloid protein and they put it into the mouse and then the mouse got memory problems. Well, in my mind, I'm not sure that really proves it because you just put something completely foreign into a mouse brain in large quantities. I think you could have done that with any protein and showed that the mouse is going to have memory problems. It's then like a prion created, disease. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anything, you put any massive amounts of foreign protein from another species into an animal, you can imagine that it's going to mess up their cognition. So then they created drugs to remove that unnatural thing they just did to the mouse and show that the mouse memory was improved. I think there's a flaw to this thinking, but this is, <laughs> this is how many studies for years have been done. I think I think the studies in, in mice for the diseases that mice normally get, like cancer, so mice normally die of cancer, those are pretty good because you're not, you don't have to do this artificial manipulation. So the other line of evidence that I think says that the amyloid hypothesis is wrong is if amyloid was causing Alzheimer's in people, you would expect that people that have more amyloid in their brain would have worse memories and more chances of Alzheimer's disease. It's not true. So hmm. neurologists have done these long, like studies where they've scanned people's brains, looked for the amount of amyloid, and then tested their memory. And there isn't a relationship there. Hmm. So to me, that's just, okay, there's no relationship there. How could this possibly be it? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but my co-founder at NeuroAge, kind of believes in the amyloid hypothesis. She thinks it might be other species that are accumulating. So there's these species called protofibrils that are before the amyloid plaque. So they're like precursors to them. And that's what the drug that's done the best in the clinics has been um, targeting that. And it's worked a little bit. So people think it's a buildup of other things maybe. Yeah. But yeah, it's amazing how you can spend billions and billions of dollars on something that may not even be what's causing a disease. Yeah, it's very disheartening, you know, a hundred years of work. <laughs> but, you know, the sooner they realize it, I guess, you know, what, what, um, do you have a pet theory? Or is there any data that suggests a different foundation for what's going on if it's not the amyloid? Yeah, so I think it is, you know, age is the biggest risk factor. For Alzheimer's disease. And it increases Alzheimer's disease risk increases exponentially after age 70. And even to the point where if you're lucky enough to live to be 95, you have a 50 50 chance of having Alzheimer's. And what we showed is that if you're biologically aging slower, you're protected for Alzheimer's. So if you're 85 years old, and your brain looks 80, biologically, you have about a 6% chance of having Alzheimer's disease. If you're 85 years old and your brain looks 90, you have a 36% chance of having Alzheimer's disease. So really the difference between whether you're going to get it or not may just be how fast your brain is aging. Um, and so I think it's these processes that are happening during aging that are causing Alzheimer's. So we know uh, expression of certain genes is going up and down. Um, there are all these aging processes within cells that are pushing you towards neuronal death, which is basically what Alzheimer's is. It's the death of neurons in a particular brain region. And um, so we think if you can turn back the clocks in the brain and have people's brains be more like 50 years old, um, that you can prevent or even treat Alzheimer's disease. So that's our strategy is to target aging as opposed to amyloid. There's a, a great book series called, uh, I think it's Co the Commonwealth series. And in the, in that series, for, the, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but, um, I forget the author's name. It's like Hamilton or something is popping in my head. It'd be funny if that's right. But, um, 
basically people go into these like these vats and they reset their bodies back to like they basically just rejuvenate them versus like they've worked out the cures and it's like that's how i felt feel a lot of this will be it's like we we don't have a cure for for alzheimer's we just have a rejuvenation re rejuvenation process that just like gets a little better every couple of years or like just like we're just like on the edge of it like we can heal what's happening we can't stop what's happening um yeah uh, which it so then how does um it sounds like you agree but then how does uh neuro age like okay I'll, I'll read i'm trying to like transition like three things at the same time to get us to the one point and i'm not doing it well for everyone listening you can make fun of me so basically there was a, a write-in on neuro age and i want to like throw it to them but at the same time it's like it's pretty wor working well with what we're saying um so a, a person cognition 1981 i got that one right i wrote that down uh they personally think that the brain rejuvenation is the most important part of health span so they would love to know what they're working on as their website doesn't really say that much so we'll use that as a jump off point because uh i think i agree the, the brain if, if if you have healthier feet it, it doesn't matter if your brain can't you know make them do things like you're we, we live in our brains in fact most of the time when i look at people i just see brains in mech suits so <laughs> so if you, i mean if we're all like little uh, astronauts and stuff but so can you can you break down a little bit more what neurology is up to because it, it is it's pretty sparse out there it's a little bit of a desert in terms of like the information on it yeah so we're a startup so we have a website but it's basically just a landing place <laughs> mm -hmm. for for things so we're we're you know just out of stealth mode basically um and uh yeah so what we're doing so this is based on the last 17 years of my research uh, as a scientist and a postdoc at mit and before that as an md phd student and i've been working on aging clocks in human postmortem brain for a really long time and what we know is that there's some people normally that have better brain aging than other people their brains are aging slower and they're protected from alzheimer's disease so what we've done is found the genes for the, what genes those people have and we're creating drugs to mimic that um to to mimic people's that are naturally have slower brain aging so we're kind of using people's genetics as a way in like you're recreating the functionality of what those those genes do so it doesn't sound like it's going to be like a crispr application in terms of like genetically engineering people to have those features it sounds like it's going to be like a pharmaceutical of some kind that you take to like if you're you know like uh, diabetes is a great example so like we don't make insulin you take insulin so what you're making is kind of like that you're making insulin so people you know don't die right it's it's so we're modality agnostic so how we're going to create the drugs we want to create each drug in the way that makes sense for the target. So we're a platform company. So we're kind of creating all these pharma partnerships. Um, so for example, we've had several meetings with Eli Lilly about an antibody strategy for some of our targets. Um, and we're going to take a small molecule approach with some of our other targets. Um, so there's characteristics of these proteins that make them uh, better to be drugged by one way or another. And so we really want to be able to go after them all. But, you know, some of them are better to be drugged by one, you know, one approach versus the other. I don't rule out CRISPR for some things. I think that could be cool. Um, and also RNA therapies, I think, are also really cool because we're, you know, part of what we're seeing are RNA levels being increased or decreased in people that have slower brain aging. So um, that lends itself nicely to creating RNA therapies. And we know how fast that can go from the RNA vaccines. It's a uh, very speedy way to get to the clinics. Yeah. So um, if it's platform technology and there's many different ways to apply what you're trying to do, I, I think I'm just left with like, what are you actually trying to do? So like the, what, what's like the first, like two or three things that you're going to be doing? Yeah. So we have uh, some drug targets. Um, so, so we're doing two things. So it's kind of a grand vision. Uh, okay. One thing is we have these drug targets. So we're going to be doing uh, cell culture and organoid validation of those targets. So we're creating drugs that rejuvenate the brain. And then we're validating them in human neurons. So people, we get skin cells from people, we turn them into neurons. Uh, so it's an all human system, which makes it more likely to uh, work because we're not working with mice 
as I said, they have all these problems, they don't get Alzheimer's. Um, and we're making sure that we can turn back the clocks in those cells. So we're making human neurons younger with our drugs. And that's the first step to showing that our drugs could work. Um, so that's step one. The other thing we're doing is developing a diagnostic test, the neuroage test. So I told you we were working on aging clocks in brain for a really long time. And we're creating a blood or a spit version that can tell how fast your brain is aging so that we can help people in a personalized way um, know whether they're on target to get Alzheimer's or not. You know, yeah. whether they need to up their sleep and low stress and exercise lifestyle interventions and eventually drugs when we have them uh, to not be on target for that. Yeah, I could see it. Uh like licensing into like a 23 and me not not necessarily that they have like once for like are you eating the right stuff and whatnot um in the sense of like there is a great feedback loop if you're if you're exercising which i think you know on your in your social media and the research bears us out like that's one of the best ways to to forego yeah. most of these things just exercising but there there's some people that are just like meta gamers where i mean I, i'm gonna ask you later about what you think about uh brian johnson's blueprint but like mm -hmm. brian johnson just a little teaser on this He's been spending like two million a year on this stuff, and so there's there's people out there that are just regular people that they want to track their health. They want to be as healthy as they can be. They have a little bit of disposable income, and um, depending on the cost, if they had like a 23andMe type kit that took care of like all their bioaging type stuff and all their health, like just like bio like a whole kit together. And I'm just picturing 23andMe because it's a fun package. I can see it licensed in there, and then you get a percentage, and then people get that stuff, and they take it like once a month if it's a uh, uh, cost effective to do that. And then they can see like, oh, I'm doing these type of interventions. Oh, my brain's getting better. These things are getting better. Because like more data is, is typically more data is good data. And then if, and then if you, as long as people can then interpret the data uh, responsibly, you don't want it like a, like a Theranos type thing where they don't even look at their data appropriately. But um, uh, so that's one avenue that you're gonna go down. Um, are you, um, are you are you so are you taking so that's one so taking a step back before that um the i think of it like a biobank you're making are you staving the cells the human cells to then uh aggregate the data in like a biobank type situation or are you just or is there intention to just um like take some of my skin cells like pl uh, pluripotent them down to like where their neurons again and then do research off of that for precision medicine and then gather that data and then preserve the neuron for like a biobank for other research that you can do off of it and then have the data from the biobank as well um, to have like a really tailored uh, precise results come from it. Is that like that kind of the idea or am I like really off? No, I mean, I think so. So you are adding an additional level of detail to what we're doing that I think would be really cool to do in the future, which is this personalized angle, which is we can, you know, take your skin cells and make your specific neurons, right? And then know that that drug is gonna work for you specifically. So that's something we can do with this biobanking approach. Right now it's it's a little bit more simple. We're just taking people's neurons. And so there's things that happen that you can see with the neurons that you can tell how old they are. So some of them are, are through tests. You can test their epigenetics. You can test their RNA levels and, and know that this is a neuron that came from someone who's 40 or someone who's 60 or someone who's 20. And so what we're doing, and you can also see changes within the neurons. So um, when you make them from fibroblasts, older people have more DNA damage. They have more shrunken dendrites. They have mitochondria are uh, misshapen. So you can see things that can tell you how old the neurons are. And so when we apply the drugs, we just want to make the 60 year old person's neurons look like the 25 year old person's neurons. So we're rejuvenating them. And that's just to, to demonstrate causation. So to show that the first level of evidence that we can have drugs that make people younger, their brains younger. And that's before we go into um, organoids and eventually into human clinical trials. So we need all the levels of evidence first, to show that these drugs are working. How are you going to get the neurons? So we take people's skin cells and we turn mm. them into neurons. Through, okay. So we add some uh, transcription factors. So what's known as transcription factors. 
So have mm. you heard of the Yamanaka factors? Yes, it's on my list to ask you about later too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the people, those are the most famous transcription mm -hmm. factors, but there's all kinds of different transcription factors. The Yamanaka factors are the are the biggest guns. They will take your cells and turn them into embryo cells, to stem cells, right? So there's other factors that are not quite as big uh, of guns as the Yamanaka factors that can turn your cells directly into other cells without becoming stem cells first. And so that's what we're doing is using these other factors. Um, and the reason that's important is because if you turn things back into stem cells before you turn them, and then you can program them back into neurons, if you do that, you lose the age. Yeah. So they, they it wipes it, the um, skin cells clean and you can't tell how old uh, the person they came from are. So instead we need to um, use this other set of transcription factors that retain the age of the donor. That makes a lot of sense. I, I think, um, yeah, if you did it the other way, you, it would be kind of useless data to develop a clock off of. I mean, I guess if you were just um, doing research off of, you know, you have the clock and you were just going to like build like a biobank off of cells, then it's fine if it goes down to zero. But um, well, I guess even then, why would you want to do that? Because then you lose the delicious data of their age and all these other things in there as well. Um, or you could do both. But anyway, um, so you're, you're building tests so that you can then ascertain to what extent your therapies that you develop, the pharmaceuticals that you develop are effective essentially. And that's, that's a uh, neuro age. I'm, I'm terrible with names. That's why I have to look over and, and double check. <laughs> I, I was, I was kept kind of thinking about calling it age neuro. And I was like, that, that's definitely not right. Um, where, where are you? So you're out of stealth mode, um, which sounds to me like you probably have the test coming along pretty well because most people hide in corners until they're, they have something to show and, and tell people about it. Um, what is this year going to look like for you guys? Yeah, so we uh, won a golden ticket through NBC Biolabs, which is this, um, and AbbVie, the pharma company um, in San Francisco. So we have lab space starting Sweet. March 1st. So we're going to start these experiments. Um, we're also going to have a beta version of the NeuroAge test that we're going to give to, you know, some early, early adopters. <laughs> Um, to try and get some data, to run a little pilot study and make sure that it works. Um, and so that's basically what this year is going to be, is the the first results from from the lab work and from the NeuroAge test. And yeah, um, so that's good. So I'm going to add a wait list to the website soon <laughs> so people Sweet. can sign up for that. Yeah. yeah and I'll... Uh... All of that will be in the show notes for people who want to be guinea pigs. And yeah. in a no downside way, I don't think there, the, no one will be harmed to the making of this test. It <laughs> no like. one will be harmed. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so then they have look, that to look forward to. March versus when you, about March is when you move in. Um, so the tests being implemented is probably going to be like a couple months after that because you have to set up the lab and, and you know, like kind of like work yourself in there. Are you, are there people you're looking for to fill out your lab, fill out your team? Or do you have everyone you need? We're not hiring currently, but we may mm. be in the future. Yeah. So I can keep, keep posted on that. Sweet. And then uh, for developing the test, are you just, is it, I know we can't go too much because that's like kind of the sauce, but on a high level, is it just like bioinformatics? You look at the data and then, then um, like just stats? Or are you doing any like machine learning to like um, train a model to, to detect these things? Yeah, it is machine learning. So the, oh, the <laughs> yeah, so the original test was in human postmortem brain. So people die, they donate their brains to science. We chop them up. We get the information back on multiomics, um, and use machine learning algorithms to tell how old people are biologically. And so what this new test is going to do is proxy the brain tests from blood or from spit. We're going to try both and see which mm -hmm. one's better. Spit, if spit is as good as blood, it's preferable because you know, it's not, you don't have to have a uh, finger prick. People yeah. would prefer that. Um, so we're gonna try both ways, but if it's significantly worse, we may have to go with blood. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're 
training again machine learning algorithms to proxy, but instead of proxying chronological age, they're going to predict the brain age. So it's going to be a brain specific test. Mm. And it's the first one being developed. So there's other tests for overall biological age, but we have the first brain aging clock test. Are you going to be um, using any of the open source AI type, like not necessarily it per se, but like some of the other technology with machine learning to supplement what you're doing? Because there's like some that are taking the underlying technology and applying it to the biotech space, I think. I thought I was reading something about that earlier today. But um, are you going to be using that or is it completely like a, a novel form of impl implementing machine learning? Like you're not going to take any open source options like that to supercharge it as of now in terms of your thinking. Oh, so which data sets are, do you mean that? So uh, open AI? Yeah, just like the technology itself. I don't think they would have the uh, the requisite data sets itself. It's just more like applying already existing and proven out models and then tailoring it to what your needs, I think is what I'm asking. Um, at the same time, if you're building the model itself, that's like pretty delicious from a, a, a venture capitalist standpoint in terms of having a, a mode around your IP. Yeah, so... So there will be element, elements of, of standard AI, but also elements that are proprietary to what we're doing. Sweet. Um, and it's pretty specialized data sets. So they're, how you handle those are um, pretty unique, unique to our purposes. How many people do you need before you have a proven model? Like how, how much data do you need? And how many, well, how much data and then like, how deep does the data have to be? Yeah, it's always better to have more data, but I think for this little pilot study, if we have 50 people, that's probably a mm. good number. And yeah, I think you'll be able to do that. Yeah, so just statistically significant results. Yeah, hopefully everyone listening in, be a mm -hmm. guinea pig. Do you have to pay for this? Will, will it be free? <laughs> or like, how do people get involved? When is that time? What are you thinking? And all this is subject to change. No one like quote this for later. Yeah, so it's either going to be heavily discounted or free. We have to work. We have to work out the numbers on that, hmm. um, and it'll be in the next three months. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So hopefully everyone listening in uh, can do that, and then it'll be a nice thing because like I like to see great things come from people coming on the podcast and seeing result come from people just listening in. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That that would be great. Yes. Um, we love uh, that. Yes. And, and, and you know, if you want to put my name on things, like that's fine too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so outside of that, so you got the test coming, but you're also, um, oh, the person had a second part to their question too. So I'll, I'll ask that real quick. Uh, cognition 1981, which is great. We're talking about like, you know, brain stuff, cognition. Um, what is, oh, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your name. There was three different ways to pronounce your name on Google. Oh. Uh, Yes. How do you pronounce your name? It's Kristen. Or you okay, that is the. Name. No, no, no. It, that's right. Okay. Well, there was one that had it was Christian, and there was one that was Christine, and I uh, feel terrible that I did that, and I'm not going to delete this so people can make fun of me. All right. So, what does Kristen think about the future of dementia in 20, 30 years? Could we rejuvenate the brain of someone that ha has already had the diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, and grant them what memories? That, that's one question and then granted what memories are lost will be gone but what could we get them back to cognitively if you um so that they could start making new memories again what do you think like the next 23 years like you have dementia uh you like you have early onset dementia now i guess in like 20 years from now it's like worse and then they can have an intervention like what do you think that would look like yeah i mean i think it's gonna be easier in people that are uh earlier stages so the earlier we get people the easier it's going to be because their neurons won't be lost but there's things that also happen within neurons that we could so i think we could prevent more neurons from dying so we could freeze people in time for sure and then the existing neurons we could make more healthy so also losing dendrites and losing connections between neurons is bad for memory so if you take the existing neurons and make them more healthy then that would improve memory so I think we could do both of those things. Sweet. And Cognition, you're welcome. Uh, so then uh, jumping into Brian Johnson, uh, if we could, we've been hearing your thesis on aging thus far in this conversation, but if there's, if you could just like, like quickly, like kind of tell us what your thesis is. And then I, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on what the heck Brian Johnson is doing. 
uh, as well. <laughs> yeah. So, so he's he's definitely attracted a lot of attention, um, both good and bad, and it created a big stir on Twitter. And I think people are going to be talking about this article for quite some time now. I actually wrote a Substack post on aging clocks and Brian Johnson just a couple days ago. Um, and so basically I, but my take is, my take is a little bit more positive. Um, aside from what he's doing with the supplements, which I, in the gene therapy, which I think is not good. I think his conceptually, what he's doing is in line with, you know, what we're thinking about, maybe not as extreme as that, but, you know, using aging clocks, figure out where you are, uh, in terms of, you know, are you aging successfully? Are you at, uh, your chronological age or younger than it, uh, particularly for certain tissue types? So if you have uh, dementia in your family, or if you're worried about dementia, you know, you might specifically want the brain tests so you can see where you are cognitively, or if you're just like many people, they just want to be sharp for a long time. You want to be your cognitive peak. Um, you can take those tests and then uh, start playing with variables. So seeing whether, you know, you can improve your scores with various forms of exercise or dietary interventions or better sleep. And, you know, I think having these feedback loops are going to be really great. Brian Johnson is has a very extreme... <laughs> extreme plan I think which was pointed out recently in that Bloomberg article so he's three percent body fat and you know works out a couple hours a day and is a vegan and has only eats very certain things that the uh, news in the news person called, called it veggie sludge sounds terrible mm. <laughs> it's just like that sounds horrible blended vegetables yeah so <laughs> I, I wouldn't suggest people go that far. Seems seems like it's, you know, there's quality of life as well. So it is also important, right? Enjoying your life. Um, but I think, you know, these are all questions that everybody wants the answers to. Is being a vegetarian better than being a meat eater in terms of your biological aging? Is, you know, cardio better than weight training? Or is both better? You know, people are want the answers to all these questions and um and i think the clocks are one way to figure that out and to have people personalize it even because what works for one person might not work for another person and you can kind of combine that with genetics and with other things to get a personalized picture of what to do to be optimized for help yeah i on one hand it's like he's supporting research that's going on which is good and people are talking about it, which is good too on the other hand it it's i wouldn't think what what works for him will work for everybody like sometimes it's like dieting you know some there's some people that have like a thing for whey protein and so if they eat whey protein that, that they won't lose weight but then if the people do like like there's some people that you know can only lose weight if they eat whey protein and stuff like that and so what works for him um that i think that's that goes back to one of the first things we talked about like metformin like people just want to be like, okay, that works. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. But they don't have, unfortunately, like everyone's not like clones, which is a really good thing. Cause then like we would get one disease and wipe us out. Um, but at the same time, I think I was reading once that like, uh, the genetic, the genetic difference between humans is not that big compared to other species. Like we're not, we're, we're not that dissimilar. Yeah. At, we're, that's true. Yeah. I think, I think that's more further evidence that like there were, there were multiple times in our past, where there was like very, very few of us left. I think it was like, uh, in Africa or something there's like, 2000 humans or something so we came back from that the, the reason that matters and why it's neat is uh how we're adaptable i think that's kind of cool uh versus like other there's like a species with a smaller population that have more variance between members like mm. there's the porpa por, porpa paita or something it's a porpoise in the part mm. of mexico that has a little uh heel thing that comes down and there's like 50 of them left and they have there's more difference between them than like if, I, if you pulled me and you, we probably are like more related, huh. which is kind of neat. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes it, I guess, easier to make precision medicine and like have some, uh, you know, if there was like more difference between us, I imagine like finding pharmaceuticals and stuff to actually do stuff for us would probably have been more obnoxious over the years. So it's like a, a downside and a, and a positive, I guess. 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I yeah. think that's really, I mean, these personalized therapeutics is really how, how we're going to solve a lot of things. It's been working really well in the cancer field. And I think it's going to be also in other fields as well, including neuro. Um, so having tests, genetic tests that say this drug is going to work for this person and this other drug is going to work better for this person is really going to help us start getting somewhere. With yeah, it's been, a, it's been kind of unfair for uh, women and uh, other people that aren't men because men are yeah. the ones who are usually getting guinea pigged. So then everything kind of tailors. So like, oh, that's kind of nice for me, but it sucks for everybody else. Because <laughs> like uh, the people who are doing these, most of the studies are just like, you know, like me. And so like that's not very useful for you. You know, like we have different, our bodies have different needs and stuff like that. Um, is there, well, I guess with your technology, you can grab from all, all population. Does it, and for your initial beta, I'll just jump back on that real quick. Are you, in, is there any intentionality to have like a, I don't know, like a slight, like a, a slice of the different types of people that exist, or is it just like whoever comes in? Yeah, I think it, I think both Priyanka and I, so my co-founder Priyanka and I, are uh, really want to have a diverse population for for the pilot. We're both invested in that, and I think women, you know, also people of color. Um, yeah. Uh, that are often underrepresented in the initial studies. So, yeah, it's horrible. And then, you know, things don't work. Like things that work for me don't work for other people. And then it's like they had, you know, because the doctors are. I think many doctors don't think to say stuff like that. So then they'll be like, "Hey, this is going to work on you." I just gave it to twelve different people. It's like all the, the twelve people look like me. And so it's yeah. like, so that they go home, and they think there's something wrong with them. You know, like like it's really disheartening to have stuff like that. So, I hope. Uh, a whole bunch of people uh, reach out and uh, are part of the study so we can have something that's universal for everybody or at least useful, useful for everybody. And I'm sure given time, like we'll, you'll be able to grab a bunch of people because I think, I think everybody's interested in aging I and mean, we're all going to die eventually. So it's like at, at some point, you know, you get your uh, interest has to click over. Um, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on just like a couple of people in the longevity space. So um, David Sinclair and Yamanak, Yamanak factors, I was just reading, he had like this big thread on some mouse stuff that uh, his, some research, uh, some results from some mice that he, like, he was able to take some that were from, that were like 80 years old and revert them, like revert aspects of it. Um, and so I, I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are uh, on A, Yamanaka factor, factors and their ability to do things to help out people when it comes to longevity. And then B, um, what do you, what do you think of that, that research on mice and and the results from it is, is it there like any hidden uh metformin stuff going on there that uh non-scientists like me would miss yeah so i did read the paper um and uh so thought thoughts on that paper i mean i think the paper is a little bit non-controversial in the sense that you know it was a step forward but we know the yamanaka factors in mice can rejuvenate them that's been shown before and these ice mice are have uh, specific breaks uh, in their DNA. And so the point of the paper was to show that DNA damage is the most upstream cause of aging. And whether or not it did that, I think that's a little controversial. So some people, and it's, this is in the discussion of the paper as well, think that, you know, there are some breaks in other types of DNA in the cell that may be confounding the experiment. And David says that himself in the discussion. But the overall conclusions, I mean, I think the big Yamanaka papers, so DNA damage we know causes aging. We've, there's been mouse models of that for years and years. Um, and uh, we know Yamanaka can rejuvenate. So I think those conclusions were already known. So I'm not sure the paper is adding like so much to this story. Um, but Yamanaka themselves. So I think this comes back to what I was saying earlier about how they're really big guns. So they turn things back to embryonic levels. And yeah. so there's concern that if you use the Yamanaka factors themselves in people to try to rejuvenate, that you're going to cause cancer or you're going to, you don't, I mean, you want your heart to be like healthy adult heart. 
you don't want it to be embryonic heart. <laughs> yeah. It won't work properly. Right? It's, it's, uh, so, so I think it's not a practical strategy that's actually going to work in people. But I think that there's other factors, which is in part what we're doing, and there's partial reprogramming strategies that uh, don't use factors that are that extreme that can turn your cells back to normal adult levels as opposed to embryonic levels. And I think those strategies are going to be more likely to be successful. So it's the for the so the dials for administering those drugs is just like on off kind of like an action potential in the brain like it meets a threshold and it acts there's no like oh, there's like kind of a broad brush it sounds like it's very much like it it goes it hits the area and it brings it back really really young and then if you want to do some type of gradation you should really move to something else in terms of like what we know for right now yeah so there's so there's two ways to do it you're hitting on something important so partial reprogramming can refer to just using the factors for less time. And so people think that they can like turn the dial just for a second and then turn it back off. And then that will not bring things all the way back to embryonic level. Um, maybe that will work. It sounds risky to me. Um, and then there's another way to do partial reprogramming is to use factors that aren't Yamanaka factors that are transcription factors that are, you know, and just restore those to healthy adult levels and then have them cascade down on all the things they control to turn them back to healthy adult levels. So that's another way to partial reprogram. And I think that strategy is more likely to be successful. Is there anyone doing that type of research? It doesn't sound like David's doing that right now. So is there anyone out there doing that type of stuff? Well, that's essentially what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm outside yeah. of you guys. Anyone else um, that we can keep an eye out for? <laughs> yeah um but mm, there's maybe so i'm not sure i'm not sure that there are other people doing that that's there a are weird some feeling companies, there are some yeah it's good for us i guess uh but there's there's um some other companies that i'm not exactly sure what they're up to but they might be up to something similar but i don't know that for sure you guys have a yeah, when you guys are at a conference and there's people that might be doing the same thing that you're doing, do you guys just kind of like look at each other weirdly? You know, it's like like <laughs> poker. It's like, I, I think maybe you're doing what I'm doing. And you don't want to say too much because they might like take it and run or something. Some people are like that. You know, I think for the most part, scientists love to talk about what they're doing. So it's like, it's more like really excited. Like, oh my God, like you're doing that. Like, and they just start talking and it's this very collaborative moment for the most part but there's some people that have gotten pretty burned by that so that are more cautious but for me yeah. i hate having to keep secrets like you know if there's other people that might be able to help you or your help if you help them like it's, it seems a shame to have to not capitalize on that yeah it is law sucks I mean, you, you look the. Uh, I think the like the CRISPR battles have really delayed a lot of things, but oh, yeah. thankfully now that we're starting to, I think we just saw um, a couple of uh, CRISPR um, therapies go out that's going to remove like I think it was sickle cell anemia or something. So it's actually like the two first therapies from CRISPR, and CRISPR's been out I think for like ten, fifteen years now. And one of the delays, other than developing the drugs, was just like people fighting over. It's like no, this 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 part's mine. But at the same time, it's like it's a trillion dollar technology. So I, I guess I get it. But um, yeah, it slows things down. If anything, I wish there was like a like a, you had like a, a phone and it's like, hey, I'm going to tell you about my idea and you don't own it. And like just they put a thumbprint. It's like, great. And then you guys can just have the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers, I'm sure would enjoy that system um, or not because then they can't get built. They can't bill you. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Arbor Gray's Lev? Like, you know, 50 percent chance in 15 years we're going to have some big stuff going on. To be honest, I haven't read about it. Mm. Um, and the reason I haven't read about it is because uh, because Aubrey de Grey has some Me Too issues. And um, so I have been trying not to promote that. Mm. Um, so I think that's... I'm very ignorant of these things. I think someone mentioned this to me. I was like, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> If it was after the episode was up, it was like, oh, I forgot to ask the guy. I would have asked him if I knew. 
But then yeah. it would probably have been a frosty interview. Yeah. So that's kind of been the big thing. I mean, that's why he is no longer at the Suns, which he started. Yeah. Um, it's because of the two issues with Celine Halua, who's the CEO of um, Oil, which is a, a longevity company for dogs. Mm. And if you look at, she had an article in Wired Magazine just a couple months ago that talks about the stuff with the Aubrey, if you want to look it up. You don't have to check it out. I, I, I looked at the wiki and it did explain. I think the Sense people just came out and this is a weird... I don't know. I don't normally talk about these types of things on the podcast, but at the same time, I'm not against them. Um, I think they came to the conclusion that he was he was inappropriate in what he said, but like he didn't he didn't like touch anyone. But like his words were not smart or good. Like like the, like that was my summary in terms of my head and how I read it. I could be wrong. Please, no one cancel me. I don't I don't read well. Uh, mildly dyslexic, but it was, uh, I think the uh, the result was that like he said bad things, and he's not allowed back. I guess, but. It was like an, like an error of judgment was the summary I got from it. If it's more than that, and it's graphic, I will read the article instead of just the wiki. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know Aubrey. I've never met mm. him. And all, everything I know is from either I talked to one woman that was had firsthand, was firsthand experience some of this. And I know what's been said on the internet. Mm-hmm. from blog posts and what Selene Kalua and, and Laura Deming have said. But, um, you know, I believe women. So if enough women are saying something like that, I believe them. I think it is, I mean, I think it's more along the lines of like what happened with Andrew Cuomo. Like there was some inappropriate hostile work environment. And um, at the time, I think, women were really young like Laura wasn't 18 yet oh. so it's that's that's uh, not good yes um rumors about so I, I don't know this for sure but what i read is that he, um from blog posts from from uh these women is that he was telling them to sleep with donors stuff like that and kind of putting pressure on people that he had positions of authority over um, and young women to do things that are obviously inappropriate. And so, but I don't know. I mean, yeah. Well, uh, the next time I have him on, I'll let him all, I'll bring up the subject and get his thoughts on it. Um, if he hasn't already spoken on it publicly somewhere, um, I try to talk about things with people about that. They don't really get a chance to talk about, but, uh, the next time I have him on, I'll make sure to make a note and let him know that I'm going to ask him uh, about it. Sure. So that, uh, which I'm sure will go great for everybody. The first time someone hangs up on me, I'm sure. But um, so <laughs> a couple of uh, uh, last things. Um, I know we wanted to talk about supplements. My ideas generally on supplements are they're scary. They're not regulated. And um, you can say pretty much anything. Like it's a very like it's kind of like crypto in the sense that like people say a lot of good things people can say anything uh but it's not like a regulated market where like i think the the guy who's the wolf of wall street said that if crypto was regulated like finance all most of these people would be going to jail like tomorrow and he said that they're gonna get you eventually which is kind of interesting uh Mm because that one guy the fxx fx whatever guy i think he just went to jail yeah 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 um supplements in my mind are very similar to this like i'm very like specific about if i take something or, or not but i know you had um uh, you want to discuss them. So I'm kind of curious, what, what is your, your thoughts on supplements or your concerns with them? So I think what's going on is this war between two different camps right now. So on the one hand, and the reason why I'm concerned about them is, like you said, they're not regulated in terms of what they are or in terms of how effective or safe they are. So there have been numerous studies where people have walked into a GNC, they've run chemical tests, scientists have and shown, oh, this thing that's supposed to be St. John's word has 5% rat poison and like very little actual St. John's word. So you don't know what you're ingesting at all. You might be able to get around that by ordering them from uh, countries that are regulated, like Canada or Europe. (laughs) Um, So that would be one suggestion. At least make sure your supplements are what they are. 
what they're supposed to be. Um, and then the other thing is, is that there's all these drug drug interactions and toxicity. So more than 30,000 people go to emergency rooms in the U.S. every year because of supplements. Either they're in liver failure or kidney failure or their heart medicine isn't working anymore because it has an interaction with one of these supplements. And people fail to tell their doctors what they're taking because they think they're natural and they don't like a vitamin. They don't need to say anything. And that's really not true because just like penicillin is a natural product too, but it's also an antibiotic we use all the time just because it's found in nature doesn't make it safe or not a big time drug. So, so that's the one side of it. The other side, the people that are biohackers say, well, bodily autonomy and the FDA is so slow and we don't have anything we can take right now and people should be able to make their own decisions. Um, and part of me agrees with that, but then there's so much misinformation out there. I think people wouldn't take a supplement that was going to cause them to go to the ER if they knew that was a risk. Right. So clearly they're not getting good information on them. So I think there could be in some ideal perfect world, there could be some like really reliable sources of information and then people could make super informed decisions and all the supplements could be tested and they could have some sort of like seal of approval that you could trust. And then in that perfect world, I would say, okay, sure. Yeah. You know, Hopefully that would mean there weren't 30,000 people a year going to emergency rooms for supplements. So we don't live in that world. So my fear in what's happening right now is that there are a lot of longevity companies that see easy money and they say, oh, we're going to, there's, there's a fruit fly that lives longer, <laughs> took this supplement and now we're just going to sell it to people. And we're going to say that animal literature says you'll live longer and, you know, and then people are spending their money. Like at worst, they're spending their money and, or at best, they're spending their money on something that doesn't work. At worst, they're taking something that's going to harm them. So this is the issue. Yeah, you're not even being apocryphal at all. I, I literally was reading about on someone's thing last week. And I'm not, I'm trying to be like vague. Because uh, we were talking about potentially coming on the show, and I was I, on high level, I was like, okay, they're doing something maybe interesting. And I just kept digging, kept digging. It's like, oh, oh, this isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally like I copied and pasted what they what they were basing their stuff off of, and it was like this isn't science. They, like, this is <laughs> this, like they weren't. It wasn't like mouse models or human studies, or it it wasn't. It was things that were so distantly removed from humans. To have been like a science fair thing for people in middle school that that they played with. It's like it, this is not serious science. I don't. I want you anywhere near my show, <laughs> uh, which is you know a decision, I guess, to not platform them. But yeah, it's it, 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 you're not joking. For anyone listening in that like hasn't looked at any of these things, like she's not joking. It it like people are. It's the wild west, and some people they'll say on the high level, hey, you know, studies validating this, right? But what are the studies? Those aren't studies. <laughs> this isn't data. <laughs> exactly. Or, or you know, at worst, so longevity.technology ran, ran an article two months ago talking about an NAD uh, clinical trial from my former boss's lab, so Elysium's clinical trial um, for NAD supplementation basis. And they said it was a positive clinical trial and it was a negative clinical trial. And it floored me because here is like a popular piece of media that lots of people read and it's just blatant lie. Yeah. And they're probably paid to say that. So it's really hard to know who to trust. Yeah. I wish, um, I wish ha Alexander Hamilton won his lawsuit two, 300 years ago. He, he, he almost, he almost, he almost established liable in a much more stringent way for news people. Like in terms of like what they can say, like they would they would have had a much higher standard. I generally think that news people, if you consider yourself news, or the government's giving you large swaths of airtime for free that they get to use, that they should have a higher, higher uh, bar to sit versus just like you know it's the twenty four hour news cycle as well. But I still think regard like 
you can have static on there. You don't have to have any, you know, things going on. But I think the bar should be higher. Like we should have a, a trust a system of some kind. Even to the point of like, if, if you say something wrong, you correct it. And then, but if you say like a lot of things wrong, may, maybe we just shut you down for a while. I don't know. Yeah. You get, you're in probation for six months. Yeah, I definitely think this is one of the big questions of our time. I mean, I know from co from, so during the COVID pandemic, I was watching news from other countries, Canadian news and um, Australian news. And it was amazing. They had much less of an issue with this. And so I asked my friends in Australia, I was like, why is your news so much better than ours? Like uh, in terms of COVID misinformation. And they were like, well, because we have regulation. Like yeah. you're not allowed to say wrong things. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, America. <laughs> yeah. In some ways it's a good thing because, you know, freedom of speech is a good thing. But then- yeah. I mean, that's why, like, like freedom of speech, I think, like, freedom of speech isn't an absolute thing as it exists, but the, the mechanisms to counteract people misusing freedom of speech, like the news people, it, it's so slow and so hard for the average person to, like, wade through. Like, there has to be special groups, like the, the end, uh, is it, it's not the end of ACP, that's a different thing. Um, you know, the, the lawyer group, the ACLU, um, that like will go around and like sue people on other people's behalf. Like who, who, who if, if someone mis misinforms and something bad happens, who's going to correct them? Like, like you, even if it's, this is like someone it made me really sad as I've gotten older. It's like, there could be laws against them. It doesn't mean that like you can have laws against anything you want, but who's going to enforce them? Like go, go drive through the Midwest. See the, see the uh, police officers pull people over for speeding. You're not going to like every now and again. Yeah. But most people are, they're just like kind of a little more hands off. Um, yeah. so like you can have a law, but like who's implementing it, it's actually really interesting. The, uh, the president of the United States at different times in the United States, the Supreme court said like, Hey, you're not allowed to do this. You have to do something else. And the president said, no, go screw yourself. I'm not gonna implement it. Cause ultimately it's up to the president to execute the orders of things that are going on. So he can be like, Nope, I'm not going to do it. It's, it's kind of neat. It's a, a very interesting system we have, but, um, so what would you suggest we need to do for supplements? Like. Is there anything being done to make it, you know, better, more safe? Ooh. I don't there. know what's being done. I mean, I, I just try to be very, so I don't personally take any supplements. I try to not platform the people that are peddling unsafe supplements. Um, I think in the long run, we at least need them. We need laws on the books that say, these need to be tested for purity at the very least. They need to be what they say they are. Um, and I don't know how, I think there was a law in the late nineties that made natural products and supplements unregulated. So whatever, I'm, you know, I'm not a policy person, but like whoever did that law, that, that law needs to be turned back to the way it was before. Um, and, but I also think we need ways to, to get things to people faster. I mean, that is true. Um, so, you know, what that looks like, I think faster clinical trials um, would be great. Like speeding up the whole process, bringing down the costs. Um, one thing that we think a lot about is, can we tack on these aging clocks to existing clinical trials? Um, so, you know, we're testing all of these drugs for various things, for cancer, for this disease, for that disease. You know, can we also have an aging clock there and say, oh, look, this cancer drug is is actually reversing aging. And then it opens up all these other um, things to do with it. So I think having some sort of like repurposing of clinical trials to make them useful in other ways would be really cool. Yeah, I've long thought about uh, slowly building out a uh, blood donation thing because it you actually make a lot of money doing it and i would i would I, in the form of like hey i'm going to do research on your blood and i'm going to let you know publish it and stuff in an open source manner well the, the margins are good even in an area where there's competition and uh I, i've thought about like if i ever get bored enough I'm, I'll, I'll start slowly building up like a blood empire like i'm a, a vampire and then use that blood and you know at the same time like they're already like letting us stuff like shove veins in like you know harvest blood so i'm sure i could get any other tissue that i needed as well for an additional fee or a payment to people and you'll get so much stuff from that i thought about it for some time wow I, I don't know. so what so the margins are good who else has a company like this 
blood uh, blood donation blood donation is not free it's a billion dollar uh uh they make billions of dollars a year and the nice thing is people get paid to do it like it's it's great for everybody oh but there's got to be all kinds of regulation with that right or uh yes and no i mean it's america if you get people to sign something then you kind of own it so i'm sure <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure as long as i paid people accordingly and i was up front about like hey i'm gonna do this research on it and it may benefit people into having living longer healthier lives including you they'd be like where's my 40 bucks <laughs> and then everyone benefits i've thought about this for some time no one's doing it maybe there's like a hurdle that stops them or someone's already doing it and i just don't hear about it because they're like very quiet about it um but most, I mean, most blood center, most places that uh, do blood donation, it's like kind of a conglomerate. Like if there's like two in a town, they're usually owned by the same company, but then they fight each other with deals so that uh, people artificially like go more and have uh, things. They, they donate more and they're more aware of donating blood because they fight each other, even though that's like my hand, my, my right and my left hand are like fighting each other. So I control it. Like I benefit from the, the conflict. That happens a lot in America, which is kind of fun. Like uh, Coke and Pepsi. I think that's uh, owned by the same organization. Oh, really? Yeah. But then everyone always says they hate each other. It's it's oh. an artificial uh, debate. I see. Yeah. America's great. Uh, so, <laughs> so supplements. Maybe, hey, if anyone wants to work with me on this uh, blood donation thing, it's great for everybody. And... You get a car out of it. I don't know. Um, not binding whatsoever. Please don't sue me. So, um, uh, <laughs> a commenter named, uh, with a username, Do Dr. Bob Moy, M A U I. That's a fun last name. If it is their last name. Um, if it is, I apologize for doxing you. But, uh, they were asking basically, like, who's the leaders in precision medicine? Um, and are services such as self decode really worthwhile to help until something better comes along? Oh, what is self decode? Sorry, I don't. It's kind of like what Open Cures does. It's like a place. It's kind of what you're trying to do. They're trying to. Uh, they're developing like a test to ascertain certain things. Kind of like a twenty three and Me. Mm -hmm. Are Are they taking? Do you know what they're collecting? Is it genetic material or? I no, I can Google it. Everyone, you're about to hear a cut. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. I I just looked up the basics. So let's see. Uh, self decode. Or I'm gonna leave this in because we keep talking. Self decode, uh, genome. What do they What do they take? DNA testing and analysis. Um, I have mild dyslexia. I don't know. It's genetic test stuff. So I don't know what they um require from you though. I see. Okay, so there's a ninety nine dollar insight plan where you upload your DNA, maybe because you already took twenty three and Me. And then you can mm. upload it here. And then they're giving you health reports, trait reports, comprehensive diet, nutrition, and fitness reports, blog posts for your genetics, supplement, personalized supplement formula. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to like, and then there's the most expensive plan has, has gives you a DNA test and it gives you a one-on-one -on -one cons consult with a health practitioner um okay so it sounds like 23 me like got in trouble at one point right because they're like over interpreting uh the results of the genetics i don't know this i've read it for one second you've been here for it but <laughs> my one second take is um that they're just trying to do what 23 and me is like not doing <laughs> which is yeah uh over interpreting the data and like giving you personalized insights i mean i think this has potential eventually but i'd have to really look into the details i mean i particularly don't like the customized supplement angle <laughs> here for all the reasons we just talked about um yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they have some sort of deal with these supplements or are selling the supplements on the website. Yeah. Um, that's like another money making thing. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, thumbs down is my initial. <laughs> <laughs> but is I is there a go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, but I with the caveat that I've spent one second looking at it. So. <laughs> I'm not cutting any of this out, so you guys will hear the entire time she spent looking at this. Uh, what would what, what's uh 
if someone who wants to do this type of stuff and it's quality, is there an organization you recommend they check out? I think this just speaks to like how much people want this and how we need to have something to be say to say to this question. Cause I don't think so. I, I think we're not there mm -hmm. yet. And um, I think that's a goal that we have uh, as well to be able to do this in a responsible way um, and to give people uh, results that they can, we're not going to, you know, tell them that they should be taking this or that supplement based on their DNA when that we don't, that's not, um, there's no evidence for that. So, but I think that this is going to be what happens in the future. I think this is like the, the fake precursor <laughs> to the real thing that's going to happen, <laughs> um, where we're able to give people personalized medicines and recommendations and, um, based on their genetics and, uh, profile from their blood. Sweet. So Dr. Bob, hope that was great. If not, I want to see your comment in the comment section <laughs> yelling at us or clarifying <laughs> and hopefully one of us will respond. I know I will. So then uh, we got a couple last questions. Um, so I've been asking this question and I think this is like a really fun way to ask it. Um, basically this weekend, this Saturday and the next as many Saturdays if, as you want, uh, what would you like people to be reading? So it's basically like, what books would you recommend that could be related to longevity? It could just be things that you love. It could be Stalin by Stephen Cotkin, who I do like. But um, yeah, so basically, what do you want us to be reading this Saturday? Or watching, but preferably a book. Oh, uh, books. Um, it's so hard because I there isn't a longevity book that I could recommend. So, um... I think, what do I want people to be reading? PubMed? Go read review articles. <laughs> you go, go do your own research. I mean, seriously. Uh, I think if you have a question, I wouldn't trust an influencer or a key opinion leader to, to answer that necessarily. You know, I yeah. would go and type in pub, PubMed and then <laughs> review and whatever your question is and 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 read what's there for yourself. Sweet. Then uh, what about non-longevity things? What would you have us check out? Uh, non-longevity things. Um, in terms of books, I think that I've been listening to. Uh, um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts. I'm a Tim Ferriss fan. I don't know. I like his podcast. Um, He's fun. Yeah. Um, I read Tangle, which I think is a pretty good substack. Um, that is sort of centrist. It gives both right and left perspectives. Um, okay. So it's not the Disney movie Tangled. No. I <laughs> no, misheard you. I was like, Tangled. Soundtrack. Um, what else? Yeah. Is this like a, like, uh, like you want an answer that's like more like poppy or <laughs> well um i think your answer is good so far i just if there's like uh if there are books that you enjoy they you know uh you get a kick out of subjecting the rest of us to it um that's fun i'm reading like Dostoevsky's the brother zarmazov or whatever the heck because someone said to read it i'm not enjoying it but at the same no. time it's yeah. fun it's fun to check it out and try new things so it's really um like a window in your mind in terms of books and people can read them. So it's fun. Yeah. It's like a book club. Book club. Yeah. So, so this is kind of fun. So one of my favorite podcasts is celebrity book club. It's all about mm -hmm. celebrity uh, memoirs by Chelsea Devonta. So sometimes I read the memoirs along with celebrity book club podcast. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, the most recent one they did was on RuPaul. As a memoir from the 90s, RuPaul's Drag Race. So, is that the uh, title? Uh, I think it's very hard to get the memoir. I, it's mm. not in print anymore. But, um, what else? Yeah, I mean, I read a lot of contemporary fiction. So, aside from from the science stuff, but. it's contemporary fiction on your mind. Uh, I'm a Neil Gaiman fan. Oh, yeah, he's great. Yeah. So, like, Stardust is what you recommend? 
Uh, I like my favorite Neil Gaiman novel is A Nancy Boys. Not not American Gods, A Nancy Boys, the sequel. I the, uh, do. The prequel. I like I like A Nancy Boys better than American mm. Gods. Yeah. Yeah. I forget the main character's name in uh, American Gods, but he was a very boring person. Like things happened to him. He didn't really yeah. happen to things until the end. And he, I think he woke up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. The characters weren't as good. Nancy Boyce has good characters. Hmm. All right. So people check out Nancy Boyce, PubMed, and Tangle. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, for and people who want to... book club if you like celebrity memoirs. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind celebrity memoirs if they were dead for like 40 years. Like then, you know, because then people have like really picked through what's true and what's not true versus like what's I'm great. I don't like reading like anyone's stuff until they've been dead for a while. Oh, yeah. I mean, true, true for like a memoir is like, the pe- you know, it's like the truth for the person writing it, right? <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Uh, then um, I know you have a, an event coming up for longevity global. global. I you know I thought it was global, but then I was like, no, nah, I've been wrong so many times. I didn't mm-hmm. believe in myself. Longevity global, yeah, uh, February sixth or ninth or something like that. So uh, I'll have that in the show notes. Is there anything else that basically? What are some things that people can keep up on? Um, what would you rec- recommend to people? Um, any events you have going on moving forward? Yeah, so with my nonprofit, so I have a nonprofit called Longevity Global. We have uh, chapters in San Francisco and New York City. We do in-person community building events. So on February 9th, we have an event. uh, That's our 2023 kickoff event that is networking and just people say what their goals are. There's a lot of founders, researchers, entrepreneurs that are trying to get involved with the space. So we're going to have breakout sessions. Um, you can find, you can join Longevity Global for free uh, on longevityglobal.org, longevitygl.org, um, and fill out a two-minute membership. So I would say that's a really good way. You can also follow me on Substack, Dr. Glorioso on Substack. Um, and I'm on Twitter free, quite frequently <laughs> as well. Um, so at Dr. Glorioso, also at Longevity GL, so you can talk to other experts in the longevity field, hear people, uh, you know, um, debating papers and the most recent things, so people have opinions on uh, David Sinclair's recent paper and other things on there, so you can kind of join in that conversation and just hear what people are saying. I think that's a good way to get real information is to hear people debating it in real time. Um, So yeah, those would be my recommendations on how to get involved. Thank you for joining us today with the Learn With Lowell show. Check us out at learnwithlowell.com. Anywhere podcasts can be found, subscribe, tell me what you thought of this episode. Check us out on YouTube in particular. That's a new thing I'm doing. Uh, Timestamps and links are in the show notes. Thank you for coming. And I hope everyone, every one of you found something today that you're curious about to learn more about. And you'll go out and be curious and learn something new. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.